Well, thank you very much, Danny. Um, as you know, uh, my name is Gerard Lassish and I'm with the Frontier Center. So Danny and I started talking about oh, a couple of months ago for sure. Uh, we started talking about this forum and one of the things that we were talking about is this idea around Alberta options. And so they wanted to have this conference and, and we wanted to make the theme around Alberta options. So part of our job uh, as Frontier Center uh, is to provide public policy. But as most of you know, uh, if you do know Frontier Center, uh, generally we're a little bit on the fringe. So essentially we are writing in controversial space, we write prolifically, uh, we usually generate ideas, uh, we're nonpartisan, and of course the big selling factor is we accept no government money. <laughs> Thank you. So the the, the nice thing about accepting no government money, uh, being nonpartisan, is that you have the freedom to research and basically explore issues however you'd like. And so that's what we do. Uh, so as a think tank, what we generally do, uh, for most of you, you may know this, is we play in the realm of what we call the Overton window. And politicians, as we heard yesterday, they play within the realm of inside the Overton window and the rest of the think tanks in the country, we play around pushing that Overton window <clears throat> from one side to the next. So it's funny, as I met some people yesterday and I, as I talk with people, um, we hear things like Reagan, Thatcherism, Trumpism, and they're all great leaders, but one of the things that is always missing in those conversations are the institutes that support them from behind in terms of their public policy. So for instance, Center for Strategic International Studies, the Institution of Economic Analysis, and the Heritage Foundation. These organizations are all obviously American or international, but you have those same Canadian equivalents operating uh, right here in Canada, Frontier being one. And what our job really is to do is to fight back against bad public policy and to create good public policy. In other words, write about it, educate you, provide you with the option. It is your job to read it, evaluate it, contemplate on it, and then tell your politicians what policies you want, the good policies, and what policies you don't want. So what I'm going to do today is, I, well, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody's aware I am a federalist pardon me, a confederalist. But also, I'm a motorcyclist. And being a motorcyclist, I had the opportunity two years ago to ride across the country, coast to coast. And along my way, I got to step and uh, visit with people in every province. It's interesting because when you travel city to city, province to province, you get a different perspective, much different. You get an even more different perspective when you're riding on a motorcycle and your wife is on the back telling you, we need to stop. But nonetheless, it is a different way. It's a different way to travel, different way to meet people, but it's fantastic. What it gave me was an appreciation of the diversity, the change, and more importantly, how Canada has changed over the 150 years. It's amazing. So when we look at it geographically, culturally, politically, there are differences. They're not that great of differences. They're kind of succinct. They're gentle, just like the borders. As I drove across the borders, I'd see the signs, now leaving, now entering. The landscape changed gradually as it went across the country. The people, their ideas changed gradually across the country. But as you know, most of you have probably have traveled, it's a pretty impressive place, especially when you're on the ground. So the purpose of this paper was to explore the ideas around how do we solve at least one problem? What is an option? 
And that one problem or that one option was uh, for us here in Alberta and from Saskatchewan uh, is just access to tidewater. And so this is a paper to explore that option. And unfortunately, this paper is a proposal, it is an option. And it's something that you can't deliver in a 280 emoji packed tweet. You need to read it, understand it, contemplate on it, think about it, think of the ramifications, think of the uh, possibilities, the potential. So I ask you today, as I go through these slides very quickly, please think about that. Instead of what our normal routine for, for as we see, is generally thumbs up or thumbs down. So before you hit the thumbs up or thumbs down, let's, let's, uh, let's just uh, stop for a moment and pause and, and, and read about it. We all know, and we've heard for the last day, and we'll hear more today, we have some real problems. We need real people to solve those problems with real solutions. That's not going to come in a 280 character emoji pack tweet. So we need people to come up and we need people to attend to listen to what, uh, what everybody has to say and propose. So you're going to hear this afternoon from a number of other uh, organizations. Frontier's not only the only one in the space. You'll hear from MEI, you'll hear from the taxpayers, and you'll also hear from Haltane Research. Uh, JCCF is here. There's a number of us organizations that are working on your behalf. So what I ask is purely to open your minds and contemplate. First slide, please. As I drove across the country, it was impressive. It was great. And in fact, what I noticed was that we ranked very high in our reputation across the world. But as I did the research for this paper, I realized in very short order, we are declining very fastly. We went from second down to seventh. For the longest time, we were bumping between first and second in our reputation around the world. And so it asked me, it made me question why was that? And the metrics that came back is it was we had a decrease in effective government in our advanced uh, economy and an appealing business environment. Next slide. So as I question this, I, I often wonder, well, why is this? Is it the current government? Most people would probably say yes. <laughs> But it, there's something more to that. And, and what it was for me was we had to look at the reasons why we can't exploit our total economic potential. And that reason really became apparent to me as I traveled across the country. What we notice uh, in this slide is Canada has, never, has not always been, obviously, the way it looks like today. In fact, in 19, or 1895, and rightly by John's uh, uh, graphs, or sorry, maps, uh, the country looked completely different. The borders looked completely different. Each section was designed, whether it was a province, or a founding province, or it was a district, uh, but it was different. Over time, these provinces, next slide, amalgamated. These provinces expanded. These provinces shrunk. And what we got was this picture today. But what was interesting driving across the country and looking at the map as I proceeded was really out of all the provinces and territories, only two had the issue of landlock. So what I started to do was look at these problems of landlock. Is that really a problem? And it is. It is actually a, a big problem. In fact, when you look at the history of how Manitobans, or sorry, how uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta started, was it was left over territory. The government sat down, they literally stroked the line and created its boundaries. And it based its boundaries, its decisions back in 1905 on equiproportionate land mass. That's what they were doing. That was in their forefront of their mind when you read the transcripts from the House. It wasn't about the economic future of Alberta and Saskatchewan. It was, we have a swell of immigration coming in to support the railway we need to divide it into two provinces. Let's equal it up and draw the line. And that's why the line looks like it does between Alberta and Saskatchewan. Simply a geometrical line drawn for the convenience of uh, somebody in Ottawa. Okay? But here's the interesting thing. Next slide. In 1905, when you go back to the, the, when you go back to the, the coverage of the day, Alberta and Saskatchewan 
we're supposed to get 714,000 square kilometers each. But when you look at it today, they somehow shrunk. In other words, we didn't get the land that we were talked about, was talked about back in 1905. There's smaller areas. So it questions, why is that? And one of the answers is, believe it or not, is back in the day, 1905, they actually didn't know themselves what they were talking about in terms of the sizes. It was really interesting when you read some of the history, it's like, well, we think there's this much land, and so we'll just divide it up and away we go. Okay. Next slide. So what are the costs? What are the, what's the problem with being landlocked? Well, there's a number of problems. In order to find out what the problems are, we look around the world and we see other countries that are landlocked. And how are they, uh, how, how do they cope? What, what, what do they suffer from? And so what they suffer from is higher freight service costs, higher degrees of unpredictability in terms of transportation uh, time, widespread rent activities, meaning being held to a, to a higher standard before they get their product out to market, and of course, flaws in the implementation of transportation systems, transit systems. Kind of sounds familiar. In fact, as you know, being in Alberta particularly, all those issues have cropped up one time or another. Next slide. So the question was, all right, so we have these problems, but what can we do about it? So when we look around the world and we look at in independent states, and we say, well, what can you do about it? Is it just the way the, the world works and that's the way the lines are drawn? And in fact, no. The world has come together at the UN and they actually have agreed around the world that these type of states are entitled to some rights. And we all agree with that, world around. And the rights are the right to access the sea. And that right is rooted in two other principles and that's the right of free transit and the right of servitude which means simply that, not to say that Alberta and Saskatchewan are independent states, but the point is, is that if we as Canadians look abroad and we hold these values up for every other country, we should be having the same values internally. We have to. Next slide. The next one that was quite interesting when we were looking at rights was this idea around riparian rights. Now most of you in Alberta, you've been through the riparian rights arguments, we've, we've talked about it, we've, we've heard about it. But what I found really interesting was when I looked to the west, to our neighbors, when we look at the three main aspects of riparian rights, in BC, it's unimpeded access to the water. And that's not just to the river. That's to the ocean. They declare it, they cherish it, they hold it dear. So they've got it, Alberta, Saskatchewan doesn't. Every other province and territory has it. Alberta, Saskatchewan doesn't. Next slide. Which leads us to economics rights. Do you have the economic rights, the same economic rights as the next province over or, or your coastal provinces? And the answer is yes. In fact, you do have the same rights. But what's funny is if you know Alberta history, you weren't given those rights. Early on, when you first became provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, you didn't have the same rights as the ones that joined Confederation. It was only years later, 25 years later, that you were given those rights. And we still fight with those rights today. Okay? But we do have these economic rights. These are international recognized rights. And again, I, I submit to you that if we, if we hold them dear and true internationally, we should be holding them dear and true uh, internally. <laughs> Next slide. So the question then becomes, okay, so how do we get access to Tidewater? And when we look at it, so we go back to how was Alberta uh, incorporated or how did Alberta come to be? It was an act of Parliament, as John said. That's what it was, right? They passed the Alberta Act. When you read the Alberta Act and the provisions thereof, it states in that act, and in fact, if you read all the acts, it states the same thing. And what it states, especially for the ones that aren't the original uh, provinces, is that the said province, Alberta, has to be treated the same as the founding provinces. They have the same rights as if they were the founding members. 
And it says that in the Saskatchewan Act. It says that in the Alberta Act. But yet, if you look through our history, it wasn't. We didn't get the economic rights. We didn't get, we, did, we weren't even considered for tidewater access. Okay? So then the next question becomes, next slide, can we change it? And as John rightly pointed out, yeah, we can. We can certainly change it. In fact, when you read the Constitution, Parliament can increase and decrease the size of provinces. They can change the boundaries. It's not that big of a deal. Well, it's a big deal, pardon me, but it's, it can happen, and that's the, that's the main point. It's not set in stone, okay? Next. In fact, it has happened. And when we look around the history of the provinces, if you look down this list, each one of those dates co uh, coincide with changes of the boundaries. The boundaries are in flux. The boundaries are dynamic. They're not set in stone. They're not inherent. And they've changed over time. And why have they changed over time? Because Canada has changed over time. Provinces got bigger. Provinces, districts merged, right? Territories have separated. So it's happened before. It's not nothing, it's not something new and, and strange. Next slide. So we shouldn't consider that our boundaries internally are permanent. They're not. They're fluid. So what I did was when I sat down to do this research and I realized that we could just change the boundaries. Being an economist, obviously we, we kind of cash out all the normative and all the emotion to it, so it's pretty easy to just say, okay, well, we just draw the line. Unfortunately, you can imagine all my friends in northern BC and all my friends in northern Manitoba, I might have a little bit of a problem doing a little bit of a road trip on my next motorcycle trip. <laughs> But the point is this, we provided two options. The two options were one, parallel-based border. And essentially, for us to have equal access to the sea, like all our other uh, uh, partners or, or provinces, um, we, we need to redraw the line. And if we redraw the line along the parallel lines, 54th and uh, 58th, you'll see the, the towns, if you will, that it would pass through. And we get to Tidewater. Now, I wouldn't recommend necessarily parallel lines, because I think parallel lines, based on parallels, is something that they did back in the day when they didn't have GPS, when they didn't have the mapping capability, the technology, right? So what I would recommend, in the next slide, is if we look at it from a perspective of um, infrastructure base, as an economist, I would look at it in terms of cost effectiveness. The infrastructure is in place. And as we are able to, and we have the will to, to change these boundaries, we can. Now, a lot of people, when they look at these maps, they say, oh, look, you're just taking a big chunk. The map's distorted. As most of you know who've traveled across this country, you can look at a map and you don't realize the extent of our country. You if you travel from Vancouver down to Halifax out to St. John's, you don't understand how big this country is. We fly here to there four hours. It's like a commute. But when you're actually on the ground, it's a massive, massive country. And so when we look at these, these infrastructure programs or infrastructure boundaries, if you will, what's interesting to note is that the population counts in the northern part of Manitoba and northern part of BC are really that great. They're all concentrated, as you know, in the south. So one of the biggest uh, problems is people will say, well, and already the, the backlash if you've been following uh, the Twitter sphere, is you're not going to take our province, you're going to take the, the top end of it. How can you do that? But most of that backlash is coming from downtown Vancouver, downtown Victoria, downtown Winnipeg. Most of it. Okay. So the question then begs, why would somebody want to separate? Why would, why would northern Manitoba, why would B, northern BC want to join another province? And it's simple. Next slide. They've got problems just like we do. 
In fact, it's quite interesting. As we did our research in around this paper, there is huge problems in northern BC. There are huge problems in northern Manitoba. It's not working. They're calling to their governments. Their governments are ignoring them. They're angry. They're upset. And so a lot of people say, oh, well, you're just going to draw the map and, and just take them over. No, we're not. But that doesn't preclude us from having a conversation with those people in northern Manitoba and with those people in, uh, and I shouldn't be saying those people, sorry, with those individuals, with our, with our fellow Canadians <laughs> in, <laughs> in northern Manitoba and in northern BC, because as most of you know, if you have traveled in northern BC, there's not much difference. You blend. You cross that border up in Dawson's Creek, they're Albertans. In fact, in 2000, that's what they were saying. They were trying to sign a petition when the non-smoking ban came in in the restaurants. And they got 4,000 uh, people out of uh, Peace, Co Peace County saying, listen, you know what, we're Albertans anyways. We shop in Grand Prairie, we go to Grand Prairie, and it's better for us to be Albertans. So the interesting thing about the research on our question is, it's almost the same. They're saying, don't tread on me. Just like you as Albertans, just like Saskatchewanians, stop treading on us. Give us the ability to, uh, to have the equal access, the equal rights as every other province. Give us the ability to decide our own futures. Now again, I'm not, I'm not a separatist. I'm the first to say that. I think we can rebuild, re, uh, rejig, if you will, and fix uh, the Confederation. I, I truly believe that. But we have to do it in such a way where we're not confined by these linear lines drawn by somebody in some far off uh, place downtown uh, um, Ontario. Just like the individuals in northern Manitoba, just like the individuals in, nor in northern BC, you're not beholden by the individuals in downtown. If it's not working out, reach across the boundary. The boundaries are fluid. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about, about my paper, and, and I really encourage you to read it, uh, you can read the tweet about it, but you won't get the whole flavor, if you will. But the big thing about my paper is this, is that as you read it, and I mean really read it, Really concentrate on it and also go through the notes. Read the whole thing cover to cover. And I'm not just putting a plug in for my paper, but just read it because there's a lot of nuggets that are in there. Because when I finished this paper, one of the big things that came out of it was that as you pull a string, more questions pop up. More and more questions pop up. So is it an answer to all the questions? Absolutely not. It's an option. Okay? And so, next slide. This is where I have to sing for my dinner. <laughs> There's lots of questions. And being lots of questions, obviously, stay tuned, because we're still going to be answering them. That's what we do. And all of the other organizations you're going to hear from today, uh, and, and the ones that you've heard yesterday, and the other ones that you know of, that's what they're doing. They're struggling for it. Now, we heard yesterday about um, uh, uh, the Tides Foundation and, and the funding that's going to the left. Absolutely. But talk to those organizations. They're on the front line. They're on the front line, and they are scraping and scratching to do the policy work that needs to be done. And so what you can do to help, what you could do to help is to read the information. Don't listen to the mainstream. Unfortunately, I mean, we study the mainstream because we have to keep in touch with it. But but there's so much information, and, and as you gathered from coming here today, there's so much information that we're missing when we're just reading the tweets. There's so much more information out there if you just ask the individuals around the room that, you, that you've heard from and contemplate and think about it. So I'll leave you with one thing. Make sure you donate to Frontier. No, just joking. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, for your time, and uh, it's wonderful to be here.